Our second scripture reading is also from the New Testament, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. Again, listen to the word of God. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. Well, we are picking back up with our sermon series on the Apostles' Creed. Today we have come to some doctrines, some truths that are very familiar You may, however, be feeling a little discombobulated to have heard Christmas scriptures, to have sung Advent carols in February on the first Sunday of Lent. It is a little liturgically confusing, I will grant you, but the truths of these scriptures and the truths of these carols are just as powerful in February as they are in December. And I find sometimes when we think about these things and ponder these things outside of the normal time of the year, when we are not pulled away by elves and reindeer, when we are not overwhelmed by all of the parties and the cookies, and we can just really focus on what these scriptures are telling us, sometimes that can be even more powerful. But I have to say, as we come to this line in the Apostles' Creed, there are more than a few Christians who seriously have problems with saying that our Lord Jesus Christ was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. This is a very controversial piece of the Christian faith. Harry Emerson Fosdick, a very powerful, influential pastor in the 20th century in New York City. He was the pastor of the Riverside Church, which was a large flagship type of church. He once infamously said from the pulpit to his congregation, I do not believe in the virgin birth, and I hope none of you do either. If you can imagine a pastor saying that from the pulpit. And earlier than that, Thomas Jefferson third president of the United States, once wrote to John Adams, second president of the United States, that he believed that someday we Christians would look at the story of Jesus' virgin birth in the same way that we look at the Greek myths. A nice story, useful perhaps, but in the end not true. 
A lot of people want to take that position. A lot of people, for them, it's easier to believe that the church made this up in the first century in order to make Jesus more important, in order to make Jesus seem more special. It's easier to believe that in their minds than to believe that Jesus was actually conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. For others, it's easier to believe that, well, Christians way back then may have believed in such things. Christians long ago may have bought into those kinds of fairy tales, but you know, we have evolved. We are scientific people now. We know so much more now than they did then. We have iPhones and GPS after all. So therefore, we don't have to believe in those types of things. We don't have to believe that God works these kinds of miracles. And yet, we still stand and say with the church around the world and with the church down through the ages, we believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. And the truth is there is an awful lot at stake in those doctrines, in those words that we affirm together. One of the biggest things is the idea of biblical authority the authority of the Word of God. Very much debated in the church today, especially in the West, in North America and Europe. Not so much in other parts of the world, but in North America and Europe today, we are very much arguing about the authority of Scripture. Do we have to accept everything that is written in Scripture as true and authoritative in our lives, or... Can we just pick the parts that we like, pick the parts that are easy to believe, and not pay attention to the rest? That's the question that's being debated over and over again today. In other words, does the Bible stand in authority over me, or do I stand in authority over the Bible? Earlier this year, within the past month, I was on Facebook. Some of you know I'm on Facebook every once in a while. Not a problem, I can quit anytime I want. <laughs> but I was on Facebook and I saw a friend of mine post a picture that was created by another mainline Protestant denomination, not the Presbyterian Church, but another mainline Protestant denomination. It was their official denomination Facebook page that had created this post and they had shared it on their wall. And it said this, the Bible is like a GPS, a brilliant guide, all-knowing, and occasionally wrong. Yeah. Brilliant, all-knowing, and occasionally wrong. That's what a lot of people believe. And there's the issue right there in a nutshell. Because as we heard in both of our scripture readings for today, the Bible is extraordinarily clear here on these matters of doctrine. The Bible clearly states Mary was a virgin when she conceived our Lord Jesus Christ and when she gave birth to him. Matthew tells us Joseph was quietly considering divorce. I mean, let's be honest here. People were not stupid back in the first century. They had figured out where babies came from. He knew Mary was pregnant, he was not the father. And so he was thinking of ending that relationship. But then an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. I mean, it doesn't get any clearer than that. But in case we have doubts, Luke tells us the very same story, this time from Mary's point of view. He probably interviewed Mary before writing his gospel. And we are told there, again, an angel appeared to her. This time this angel is named. It's Gabriel. And he told her that she would give birth to the long-awaited Messiah. Mary responded with one simple logistical question. How will this be since... I am a virgin. 
Gabriel, there's a really important step missing here. So how is this going to happen? And he went on to explain. So if we're going to take the Bible seriously, and honestly, I don't see how we can't, at least not without getting us ourselves into all kinds of problems down the road, then we have to accept it is very clear in its teaching that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of Mary, who at the time of the birth was a virgin, though not necessarily afterwards. Here's where we have some disagreements with our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Mary remained in that state. In fact, it's implied that she and Joseph then got married and had a normal marriage relationship. In fact, Jesus, we are told, had brothers and sisters, and they're named in Scripture. But that's another, another point for another day. The point here is, if we believe that God speaks to us through Scripture in a way that he doesn't speak in, through any other writings or books, if we believe that the Bible is inspired by God in a way that no other writings are inspired, if we believe this is God's word to us through which he primarily talks and speaks to us, then we have to accept Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. And in fact, if we don't accept these miracles, if we get rid of the virgin birth of Jesus, then we are essentially getting rid of salvation itself. The great, one of the great foundational principles for the Judeo-Christian faith is what is called substitutionary sacrifice. I know that's a big term, but let me break it down for you. Substitutionary, someone or something being a substitute for us, being in our place on our behalf, sacrifice, being offered to God. So the idea that someone or something could be sacrificed to God in our place on our behalf it's one of the great foundational principles of our faith. Because the Bible is clear, we are sinners and therefore we deserve to die. The punishment for sin is death. God laid that out in the Garden of Eden. He didn't change his mind all the way through scripture. And it makes sense because sin is turning away from God. God is the source of all life. So turning away from God means rejecting life and choosing death. And in the Old Testament, God was gracious. He provided a system of sacrifices in which something other than the people died for those sins. An animal was offered as a sacrifice, as a substitute, so that the people did not have to die for their sins, but something did die for those sins. Now, that was only ever temporary, God was preparing his people for the great sacrifice that was to come in the New Testament times. And that makes sense because an animal cannot be a true sacrifice, a true substitute for human beings. Human life is different from animal life. We all know this instinctively. We talked about this a few weeks ago when we talked about creation. Only humans are created in the image of God. Animals are not. They're still loved by God. They're still God's creation. They still belong to him. But humans are created differently. And so we need a human to be our substitute. We need a human to die in our place. But where are we going to find that person? Where are we going to find a human being anywhere around the world, anywhere throughout time, who is worthy of to die in our place? Where are we going to find a human being who has not sinned, in other words? Do you know of any humans that have never sinned? I know some people think they've never sinned. My dad, not long after uh, he came to uh, Ashtabula, where I grew up, uh, one of the things he changed about their worship service is he put the prayer of confession back in. It had been taken out 
in the previous pastor's tenure, and a lot of the people got mad. In fact, one person, an elder, if you can believe it, came up to him and said, Pastor, I don't like this prayer of confession in the bulletin every week. What if I haven't sinned that week? Why do I need to confess to God? Dad said, let's talk. <laughs> let's talk about sin. Let's talk about confession. Let's talk about grace. There is no human being who is sinless, who can serve as a true sacrifice, a true substitute for our sins. And so God stepped in. God chose to become that human being, to become that substitute to die for our sins. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, came to earth taking on flesh so that he could die in our place. And as God, he has the power to resist sin. See, that's our problem. We don't have that power. We are broken. That, is, that power was broken within us. Even for all of our good intentions, we still do the things we don't want to do. We still neglect to do the things we should do. But as God, Jesus has the power to resist sin. And by taking on our humanity, he has the right to be our representative, to be the second Adam, creating a whole new race of humans, people who are redeemed and who are born again and given new flesh, new people, new life. And the virgin birth was necessary for that to come about. Joseph was told that Mary's baby would be conceived by the Holy Spirit, that God himself would be the father of Joseph and Mary's child. Mary was told the Holy Spirit would overshadow her. Now that's a term used in the New Testament for when Moses and the children of Israel had finished building the tabernacle and are dedicating it as the place of worship and the cloud of God's glory comes and fills and overshadows that tabernacle. He fills it with his presence, his glory. It's also a term that God says he will do to us when he covers us and protects us metaphorically with his wings. So God somehow mysteriously filled, protected, overshadowed Mary. That's all I can tell you about how that worked. It's mysterious. I don't know exactly how that worked, but God does, and that's okay. I don't have to know everything. If I do, I'd be God, and clearly I'm not. But it's a mystery how that happened, and yet the Bible tells us it did happen. And it means that Jesus is therefore fully, 100%, God. He didn't just seem God-like. He didn't just pretend to be godly. He was not just a human being endowed with some super God consciousness. He is fully 100% God, and he is fully 100% human. He didn't just seem human, he didn't just pretend to be human. He didn't just take on a body for a time and inhabit and fill that body and then put it away. He was and he is absolutely 100% human in every way except one, he did not sin. So that means like all babies, no matter what it may say in the hymn, Away in a Manger, Jesus did cry. It was not a silent night, I can promise you that. There was a lot of screaming and crying. And if you ever see a birth, is it quiet? No. And this was a real human birth. Jesus did cry, Jesus did spit up, Jesus did fill his diaper, Jesus did nurse. Jesus did keep his parents up to all hours of the night and he made his parents unbelievably happy like all human babies. And as we read in the Gospels, we read of do Jesus doing things that human beings do. He ate, he drank, he breathed, he slept, he died. That last one is really important. We'll talk about that next week. But Jesus was and is still 100% God and 100% human. 
Now, how can one person be both 100% God and 100% human? How can one person have two full natures? I don't know. It's like the Trinity. This is another one of those great mysteries of the faith. I can't wrap my mind around that. But like my mom is fond of saying, I also don't understand electricity. And yet I still go and flip the switch and turn on the lights. I don't have to understand it. The Bible tells me that it is so. The Bible tells me that it is true. And so we affirm it together and we believe it. And again, it's the virgin birth that made all of this possible by this different kind of conception and this different kind of birth. Jesus was spared from inheriting the taint of sin that we all have inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve. He was born sinless, which is the only way that he was fit to be our savior, our substitute, the sacrifice for our sins. And yet he was born completely human. The only way he was worthy to serve as our representative, to live that full righteous life for us, to die that atoning death in our place. Jesus is the God-man, and only a God-man is able to save us from our sins. This is the good news. We were in desperate need, and God responded to that need. God heard our cries for a Savior, and he acted. He entered into our world. We've heard this thousands of times, but it doesn't matter how many times we hear it. It's still just as amazing, just as wonderful, just as splendid, that God would leave the glory and splendor of heaven that we are all longing for, that we can't wait to experience. He left all of that behind to become an embryo, a fetus growing in the womb of a Jewish girl who lived in the middle of nowhere. And again, we talked about it a couple months ago, but it bears repeating, that means Jesus was not born in our beautiful, sterile, state-of-the-art birthing suites that we have in hospitals today. He was not attended to by a credentialed specialist with multiple medical degrees. He could have been. He could have chosen to be born in our time. He had the power, certainly, to do that. He chose, for whatever reason, we don't know why, we just were told the time was right. He chose to be born when and where he was, in a smelly, overcrowded village, where the only place that was left to serve as his cradle, as his bassinet on the days he was born, was the place where the animals came to eat their food, a manger. Now, again, some of you have given birth or have witnessed a birth. You know birth is not a neat and tidy experience, is it? Birth is messy. Now imagine birth in a barn. Animals. That's what God was willing to enter into. God was not repelled by the mess. God was not repelled by the mess of our world. God was not repelled by the mess of our lives. God entered into that mess. He became one of us and experienced the mess firsthand. And he grew up as a carpenter's son. That means he knows hard work. He knows blisters, sunburn, aching muscles. He grew up knowing all of the trials and troubles and experiences that we have in our lives today. He knows what it means to be hungry. He knows what it means to be tired. He knows what it means to be in pain. He knows what it means to be sick. And he knows what it means to be deceived. He knows what it means to be betrayed. He knows what it means to be used. If you ever are tempted to think that God is all the way up there somewhere, and has no idea what we really experience here in life, that God can't relate or understand what it is that you are going through, think again, because Jesus lived a full human life, and he experienced all of the things that we experience. He knows what it means to suffer. He knows what it means to hurt. 
he knows what it means to grieve. And when the fullness of time came, he submitted to being executed in the worst way that we've ever come up with for killing somebody as our substitute, as the sacrifice for our sins. Folks, that is how much God loves you. But he was willing to go through all of that. And he didn't have to. We certainly didn't deserve it in any way. And yet he chose to do this. God's love is so amazing and so divine that he took the initiative to do for us what we could not do for ourselves so that we might be healed, so that we might be saved, so that we might be born again and made new. As our first and our last hymn remind us, the road from Bethlehem leads directly to a hill called Calvary. In other words, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary so that he could suffer under Pontius Pilate, so that he could die, so that he could be buried, and even so he could descend into the pits of hell itself for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To God alone be the glory. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the miracle, the miracle of your birth, the miracle of your life, We thank you so much for your absolutely amazing, overwhelming love for us. Lord, sometimes we forget about it. Sometimes we're tempted to doubt it. In those times, Lord, remind us over and over again of all that you were willing to do for us and help us, Lord, to have that same love for you and for others. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.